that should have been like really crazy amount of like serious applause from all of y'all because then I'm like, they don't really know exactly who I am. But also, hold on, hold on, hold on. Blah, blah, blah. Also, because you guys know who they are because they're like killer, amazing people. My friends and also my sources, Gaby Pacheco and Jose Antonio Vargas, please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Right? I know, they do, they do deserve a standing ovation because they are American heroes. They're American heroes. No, what you guys are going to do now is you're going to take out your phones and you're going to go to your podcast app and you're going to subscribe to uh, Latino USA. Yes, you should. And then you're going to subscribe to In the Thick. And then you're going to be like, oh, that's, I was listening to her. So you can do that. Um, I see <laughs> that some of you are not doing that. <laughs> Just do it if I were you. You know I'm Mexican? Wow. <laughs> That's all it takes these days. That's all it takes these days. Um, so actually, let's start like this. We're going to talk immigration. That's what we're talking about. We've got 30 minutes. I'm very interactive in my panels. So if you have a question that you want to ask, basically after I've, they've introduced, I want them to just take a minute and introduce themselves and say a little bit about how they're feeling. Just raise your, quest, raise your hand. And we're going to start incorporating your questions and make it super interactive. That's cool with you guys, right? Great. Um, so, um, so basically, my name is Maria Hinojosa. I was born in Mexico City. I was raised on the south side of Chicago. I am the first Latina journalist at NPR, like from years ago, NPR, PBS, uh, CNN. And then I formed my own company, which maybe some of you will come and intern with. We're on 125th Street in the heart of Harlem. It's called Futuro Media, and we produce Latino USA, In the Thick, we produce for public television. And we, we basically do journalism from this perspective. Mexican immigrant woman, okay, before I hand it off to Gabby, I'll just say, it's a joke, please, it's a joke. Please don't be a little shocked. <laughs> Nothing can shock you guys, but, um, so I am five things right now that this, that this president does not necessarily like. So I'm Mexican. I'm an immigrant, I'm a journalist, I'm a woman, I'm flat-chested. <laughs> Thank you. Where are the applause for that? I heard the grunts. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I do. Wait, wait, wait. I box. I <laughs> Gabby, so tell us, tell us, I didn't get a chance to say how I'm feeling, but tell us just like the 30 seconds, like who are you, what you want us to know about you, and how you're kind of feeling, because we, this is super important. We understand that this is historic, and we have a message for you. So just straight up, how are you, how are you feeling, who are you, and what's your first out-the-box primary message to our students? So I am just beyond angry. Um, there's part of me that's devastated, that feels broken, um, that feels just tired. But the other part of me um, doesn't allow that to kind of carry me. I acknowledge it because I think it's important to acknowledge that. But I also feel a lot of hope. Um, I also feel that I have to believe in myself and the power that I have to make a difference. And I also believe in you all and believe in um, other human beings, realizing that what is happening today to our communities, to immigrants, to um, people of color, to gay people, um, that it's wrong and that I don't have to be black to stand up for black people, that I don't have to be gay to stand up for gay people, and that it's time for people to stand up. Um, and up until... Up until not too long ago, Gabi, you were a dreamer? Yes. Um, and so Gabi has um, really dedicated, she is one of um, the most visible and activist dreamers that we know. So she is an important character in American history. Your children will be reading about Gabi Pacheco. They will also be reading about Jose Antonio Vargas. Um, and I... Um, <laughs> They'll be going to a school. They'll be going to a school named, named after Jose Antonio Vargas. Yo, right. Oh, <laughs> that's crazy. Okay. 
You know what I love about Jose Antonio Vargas is that, you know, we know how powerful he is, and yet he operates from a place of humility. And, um, and as a journalist, that's kind of core to what we do. But I just oh, love that um, about you, mi querido Jose Antonio Vargas, my colleague, my fellow American journalist. So um, how, how you feeling? And what's the message? Uh, I'm feeling like every time I've gotten in trouble, women always save me. Hmm. <laughs> uh, so that's kind of what this is. So all the men out there, just make sure you love women in all the ways that you can love them. Uh, <laughs> right? Like, uh, you know what I mean? It doesn't need to be, you know. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. So the second thing is, um, I'm a big James Baldwin fan. Yes, James Baldwin, yes. And he has this great quote about, I cannot be a pessimist because I am alive. To be a pessimist means that life is nothing but an academic matter, so therefore I am forced to be an optimist. So I kind of hold on to that a lot, like my optimism, which is I think probably the core part of who I am as a person. And I'm optimistic that this world that we are, like. I was talking to Jelani Cobb, who's a fantastic journalist and historian and all that, and I asked him, what, what is really the historical parallel that we're living through, right? And he said, uh, post-reconstruction. Do you guys know what post-reconstruction is? Yeah. A little bit, right? Read the book Beloved by Toni Morrison. It'll explain what reconstruction Beautiful is. Beautiful book. Beautiful book. But like, and then he said that, and I started thinking about the fact that we are going through a reconstruction and a civil war all at once, and you, you, are literally going to recreate what the country looks like, mm -hmm. and who gets to be at the center, right? Like, this is actually a pretty rare panel here at Aspen. You have three people of color in a panel. I think this is the only people of color panel in all of the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is kind of staggering. You mean it's the only one where it's only POC? Yeah, it's only us. Really? Which is great. Um, but wow. I just think it's important, you know, okay, this is longer than what you asked, but let me just say this. So a few years ago, um, I started realizing that whenever I would ask, you know, white people are so used to asking people of color where we're from. So I kind of started flipping the question around, asking young white people where they're from. And I was at the University of Georgia in Athens, and it was the president of the college Republican, and I'm like, hey, where are you from? He's like, I'm American. I know, but where are you from? I'm white. Well, white is not a country. Where are you from, right? And then he says, I don't know. And I just thought that was really kind of staggering. Like, how can you not know, right? How you got to this country, what, you just like plopped on in here? Is that it? Right? Unless you're Native American, unless you're black who was forced to come here to build a country for free of slaves, you came from somewhere. What was the story of how you came here? So that's how we started like, the Define American chapter program. So there's like 60 Define American college chapters across the country right now, made up of white, black, Latin, Asian, Muslim, Middle Eastern people, all asking each other, what does it mean to define American at a moment like this? And I hope that all of you in some way engages in that conversation. Because it's either you engage, right? Or you're gonna be living through cycles of all of this, right? It's either you engage or we just are gonna keep repeating this over and over again. So I, I actually find it um, interesting. Have any of you ever, for another history lesson, you guys are like horrified. They're like, ah, oh, scared. Have any of you okay. studied the, what's called the great repatriation? Okay, that's fascinating. Gosh. Whoa, okay. So basically, in the 1930s, yeah. what we're living right now, this massive deportation, yep. happened in the 1930s in California and some other states in the Southwest. It was at the time of the Great Depression, and they basically rounded up Mexicans, yep. many of whom were American citizens, and there was no social media, there was no kind of, and, and, and there was no way to kind of communicate this, and so people were just sent back to Mexico. It's called the Great Repatriation. It's actually, uh, up until now, was the largest mass forced um, uh, relocation of people in the United States history. Yep. The reason why I bring that up is because who gets to tell that history? Why is it called the Great Repatriation? That wasn't a repatriation. Why is it called the Japanese internment? I'm assuming that you guys have heard about yeah. the Japanese internment, right? 
right, you've heard about it. It's called the Japanese internment. It was the imprisonment of innocent American citizens. By the way, they were told that it was for their own good. Yeah, I remember that. By the way, as we're thinking about the children who have been literally forcibly separated from their parents at the border, what we are hearing the government saying now is, we're taking care of the children. We're doing this to take care of the children. So we need you, as both Gabby and Jose Antonio said, we, get, need, we need you guys woke. We need you bringing forth your narrative from your lived experience. Yeah. And I guess I'll just throw out this other thing that happened. I was in Omaha, and this dude, um, he was like 50-something white guy. And I'm always talking politics with anybody. And, um, and so I asked him who he voted for, and he was like, I voted for Trump. And I was like, okay, why? And he was like, well, you know, I really want him to build that wall because I want him to keep all those gangbangers and drug dealers and rapists out. And I was like, dude, you live in Omaha. There's a lot of Latinos here. Do you see all those gangbangers, rapists, and murders? He was like, no, nicest people. He said, well, I still, I, I voted for Trump because I believe in that Muslim ban because they need to keep out those Muslim terrorists, you know. I was like, dude, you live in Omaha. There's a large Muslim community here. Are there terrorists? He was like, no, you know what, that's my neighbor. And then he said, wow, you know, maybe I need to stop listening to what they're telling me on the Fox News channel that he watches and need to start living in reality. You guys live in reality and we need you to be sharing that reality with your family, with your fellow students, and saying this is nothing to be afraid of. Just let me just add to that for a little bit. You know, freedom, <laughs> which some of us don't have, right? Like, there's not a lot of things that I can't do. But freedom is like here. Like freedom, my independence and my freedom is the most expensive thing I own as a person. That even though they say that I can't leave the country because I won't be able to come back, even though there's like a warrant that might get filed, I don't know. Even though there are things that I can't do, I know that in my mind I am free. And I know that in my mind I am independent. Then that means I am free to think, I am free to own myself, right? And I hope that like as you learn, right? Because um, you know, you're, all, you're young and you're learning, which is really such a beautiful thing. I hope that part of the learning is also like owning where you fit in all of this. That when kids are getting caged at the border, you actually have a role to play, mm -hmm. right? That when some friends of yours who happen to be black and you hear a stereotype, that you actually have a role to play, that silence is the problem, right? You have to own that. And you also have to own the fact when you're being a coward about it and ask yourself why. Why don't you want to speak up, right? I think that's important as well. Um, so one thing I, I do want to say is that, because um, people come up to me and say, other undocumented people, say, how did you do it? You know, how did, why did you come out? How did you come out? I'm so afraid. And what I tell people is that not everyone needs to be marching with a sign. Not everyone needs to do a walk from Miami to DC. Um, there's all these different things that you can do. And some things can seem small, but they're not, right? Um, because when Katie was talking when she was up here, she talked about a little tiny seed, a little small seed that she planted, and that thing grew to a 40-pound cabbage, that from there she was able to feed 200 people and from there, other things happen, right? It's that ripple effect. And if there's one image that I can put, it's kind of cliche-ish, but it is true, right? It's that little pebble that you throw in the water that creates the ripple effect, that you don't know where that ripple effect goes, but you know that you've done something. And I think it's really important because sometimes um, I do feel impotent. I feel like I should be in the border right now or I should be in the middle of, uh, of the country talking to people and saying, I'm not an alien. You know, you can check my little head. There's no little antennas coming out, right? I'm a human being, like, hear me out. Let's talk, right? 
but I can, right? I have my job and I'm doing the scholarship program and helping and doing all this stuff, right? So don't let your frustration of feeling like, I don't know, I'm not an immigrant. I don't know another immigrant. Stop you from listening, hearing, learning, trying to figure out what you can do. What is that little seed that you can plant? So I want to tell you guys, um, <coughs> because I'm often on the road, um, I'm always having these conversations. But I, part of what I try to do is to bring the humanity that I hope I have as a journalist to everyday actions. And that means I'm having a lot of conversations like with that cab driver in Omaha. But I had it here. Um, <laughs> because I'm in hotels a lot, um, I um, actually start, I ask the people who clean if they get paid by the hour or by the room, and if they're paid by the hour and I'm spending more than one night there, I'll say, you don't have to clean my room. Take a break. <laughs> um, and I said that here to the woman here. We started speaking. Um, and then short, long story short, she, um, she's trying to get her papers in order. Um, and sh there are some situations that she's facing that are really challenging. That's somebody who arrived on this campus at 5.45 in the morning, this morning, when everybody was asleep. And it's somebody who is right here who is making all of this possible. And so I always, I'm, I'm one of those people who engages, you know, like, and says, and we can't do it every day, by the way. Some days I'm like, please, I'm in an I'm in a airplane. I just don't want to talk to anybody right now. But having that humanity of like, you're cleaning my room, you're serving my food. You're delivering the pizza. When they, when they would deliver pizza, because my kids grew up in New York City, so there was often delivery. And the delivery guy was a Mexican dude who spoke five languages, <laughs> including Nahuatl, languages that predate English. Chance for my kids to yep. see, this is your ancestral blood right here. You are Mexican. Even though they were going to elite high schools, like some of you, and were hearing Mexican jokes. Yeah. Um, so, I, you guys are very attentive. Questions, yes. No, I feel like you're, I, I Ooh, love the fact that you're listening a question over there. so attentively. And we have a question right here in table 12. Oh, there's a And if there's another question, do you have another question? Raise your hand so the person can, okay, great, we have them. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Huang. And he wrote it down. Yes. What's up, man? So, Jose, you mentioned James Baldwin. <laughs> yes. And one piece of his philosophy is that if one vulnerable ethnic group is completely oppressed, then the, then the next ethnic group will be taken in the morning. Mm. Do you believe that this will occur if we as scholars don't step up? I think it's already happening now. Oh, great question. Okay, great. Um, I think it's already happening now. I wish, for example, that non-black immigrant communities would do more for black people. Um, I think that is actually something that I see a lot happening. Like we consume so much black culture Right, and yet when it comes to like protesting or giving money or showing up for the black community, it doesn't happen a lot, right? I was aghast, I didn't know this. There was this fascinating Chris Rock documentary called Good Hair, mm -hmm. came out like 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that Asian businesses profit from black hair. So I was in this really fancy conversation a few years ago and I said to all my people in the, it was mostly Asian and I said, so like, if Koreans are making money on black people, what are Koreans doing for black people? Mm. Silence. Now, no one wanted to hear that question, but guess what? I'm not here to not ask questions. <laughs> like, I may not have answers, but I have a lot of questions, and that's one of them. So I, I just think it's really important that we do that, especially now, for me, the thing that I worry about a lot is what people call white anxiety, right? I made this film called White People for MTV a couple years ago, it's on YouTube, you can check it out. I was really quite aghast when we were making the film. We did a, MTV did a study that apparently, I did not know this, 74% of white people live in predominantly white towns mm -hmm. and 90% of white people only have white friends. And no, no amount of listening to Rihanna and Drake count, right? And then, according to the study of 1,000 white millennials, white millennials feel that they're as much a victim of racial discrimination as people of color. Correct. Correct. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What and is so do, that? And so do older whites as well. Yeah. So what is that about? And how do we talk about that with each other? I wonder if it has anything to do with the fact that the majority of the people who own the national airwaves and national that, news media and the papers and everything that you consume that's part of the mainstream media, the majority of all of them are white men. Yes. 
and the people so who form that, that narrative. But how do we, how do we, where, where does empathy fall in all of this, right? Like when white people talk, you know, in the film, talk to me about, I don't even know what being white means. I'm like, well, how do we find that out together, right? Like how, what happens when a white person or a classmate says something, you know, racist? <laughs> what do you say? Do you just shut them down? Or do you want to understand where it comes from? Right? Of course, sometimes you don't want to have to like, keep informing people because it's, it's heavy to have to carry other people's weight. But then how do we solve it? These are the questions that I'm asking myself a lot. Right? I'm working on a documentary later on called Straight White Guys that's going to get me in a lot of trouble. But I feel really important. I feel really like that's like a, qu a conversation for me is like, where do straight white guys fit in America today? And we have a question from somebody who's not a straight white guy. Oh, yeah. Before, before your question, okay. I, and, and maybe I, I, did, I may derail this just a little bit, but I, I want to do a room check. OK. Ooh, yay. How many of you, let's just be honest, and, and um, I feel that you all have been coming into these spaces, and this is a safe space, right? How many of you are feeling a little bit of uncomfortable with what we, we're talking about today? Just like be honest. Be honest. Like, do you feel uncomfortable? And Thank okay. you, sir. Who else? Yeah. Like, are you feeling uncomfortable with what's being said up here? Like the conversation we're having. I just, I, I just. It's can you put it higher? I can. It's just really it. important. Well, it's not a lot of people. So oh, yeah. I'm oh. trying. It's not a lot of people, yeah. from what I can see. Huh. So I wonder if any of you would talk about your discomfort. Yeah. Okay. Can you do that? So hold on. So I think you. I'm sorry. Ask yeah. Just, just hold on. Gabby said she was about to derail things, so oh, she I'm just sorry. did. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. But you know, <laughs> you don't step up to a Latina and say no. So I'm biracial. I'm mm. Japanese and white, yep. wherever that is. Um, and so there's often some discomfort when talking about um, racial lines. Um, because oftentimes I'm like, where do I fit? Yeah. A lot of people oftentimes will make sort of say stuff about how white males are dominating the world. And then oftentimes people make racial slurs about Japanese people. Yeah. And so oftentimes I'm in this like place where I'm like, I, I don't know if I can fit into either. All I know is I'm American. Um, One thing that happened to me when I was growing up Mexican and also like, I kept, when I was in college, I kind of had this moment, um, and it happens often, where we just have to get into our heads and completely celebrate how insanely cool it is that you are white and Japanese and how cool. fabulous it is, how, how the fact that you have the ideas of do I fit into this or that is exactly what makes you so fabulous and unique and incredible. So instead of walking around, like when I go back to Mexico and I'm like, oh my God, I'm Mexican, but I don't feel Mexican enough and I don't speak my Spanish and this and what do I, and I sit there and then I'm just like, this is the coolest thing that I can be feeling all of these things. Because we're so, um, in this country, there's so much internalization of stuff. So I'm just saying, take a moment to, st and okay, that sounds really cheesy, to celebrate yourself. That sounds horrible. <laughs> no, Please it's, don't, no, it's not. But you know what I'm saying. I don't, yes. Okay. <clears throat> uh, my name is Style Ranger from Phoenix, Arizona. And like Huang, I'm a Bessel best scholar. And I wanted cool. to present to you, I remember in one of the sessions, you said you don't like to use the term minority. And huh. I agree with that because... Um, if, we, if minorities unite, guess who will become the majority in America real quick? And what I wanted to present was, like in the MLK speech, I have a dream. Thousands of thousands of people watching from TV and who were actually there were united. Um, they had the same passion, the same goal to create change. And unity is a power. It, it really is. And so I was wondering, what will you propose? propose to us youth how we can go back to our communities and try to create this unity that, you know, the higher power tries to keep us divided because they know if we join together, we would have so much more power. Cool. All right, great. So we have, um, Gabby, you've got 15 seconds to answer that. Oh, and gosh. Jose Antonio, you've got 15 seconds to answer that, and I'll you just ditto. And yeah. that's what, so. So, um, I'm happy that I asked the uncomfortable question, and I'm happy that there are people that are uncomfortable. Because I want you, part of the unity, is to realize that we get tagged with so many different labels, right? Um, there is this huge 
on beside immigration, right? Jose and I, we've talked about this. There's this huge divide in our country between black and white. But what is black and white, right? Why can, it, can, why can we unite as human beings, right? And so I think to, to answer your question, um, let's start having uncomfortable conversations. Let's start really trying to see each other as human beings. I, yeah, I, I agree about not using minority anymore. I think there's a new emerging majority that is happening and it's all, it's gonna sound really cliche, but it's literally all of you who's gonna create it. All the rules about, to me, gender equality is one of the, I, it's fascinating and essential what's happening and looking in your life, every part of your life. Again, I started, I said this a few minutes ago, like where do women fit in all of this fundamentally and structurally? You don't have to be a woman to be a feminist. I would actually argue that male feminists are more important than ever, mm. right? Um, and I say that as I, I, I interrogate why my mom felt the need to send me here and she couldn't have a life, right? That. So I think the, 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 this creation of this new majority is something that you all are literally experiencing as you're living. And it's fascinating. God, I'm so jealous of you. I wish I were younger. I usually don't say that, <laughs> but yeah. Being young is great. <laughs> um, I'll just ask you this after I ask you to subscribe to my podcast, which you guys did. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, there are, again, there are two words. Thank you for bringing that up that you will never hear on the media that we produce because I'm not a straight white male. And so I, I make decisions about our newsroom. So we don't use the term minority yep. because I just I think that that's a, a strange and weird concept right now. And I don't think it's conducive. And we don't use the term illegal to describe a human being. So we, you will never hear us say, and then there were, there were some illegals over there or that illegal immigrant, and you probably hear your family members and friends talk about the illegals and just giant, gently and kindly say to them, you know, there is no such thing as an illegal human being. You may have committed an illegal act. Some of you, know, you're not old enough to drive, but when you get old <laughs> enough to drive, if you get commit, um, you know, get a traffic stop or something, then, then you would be called like an illegal driver forever. No, you're a driver who committed an illegal act. You're an immigrant who came illegally or without papers. There is no such thing as an illegal human being. Yeah. Thank you so much and have Thank a great you. rest of your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.